Thank you very much and thank you for all of your, uh, your time today. So I'm here talking about critical minerals and strategic minerals and I'm here talking about Kazakhstan. Um, we've been going to Kazakhstan since 2019. I moved my family there in August uh, of, of last year, so we've lived there for about 18 months now. Uh, settled in very nicely and it's a truly wonderful place to live that I'm happy to talk to anyone about after this as well. Um, it's huge. Kazakhstan's huge. Uh, it's bigger than Europe. Um, and that's why we're there. There for a stable jurisdiction for a big, very mineral rich country. And it's so mineral rich that uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom have both signed um, memorandums of understanding in the last month for critical and strategic mineral supply. Uh, it's also incredibly well connected, uh, obviously trying to avoid the people to the north at the moment. Um, the middle corridor pipeline is becoming incredibly strategic. And what we're seeing is huge, huge uh, focus on, on Western Europe. And that's why Glencore there is there, and that's why Fortescue, who've pegged more than 45,000 square kilometres um, in Kazakhstan, one of the most successful international uh, exploration ventures, and I think in the very near future we'll be adding Barrick Gold and First Quantum to that list. So um, a very, very exciting time to be there. Something to point out as well, recent conversations with the European Commission, European Raw Materials Alliance, is Kazakhstan is a global gateway partner to those two institutions or to, to Europe in general, is now available for all of the grant funding as if it was a European country. So I think what we'll be doing towards the end of, uh, or to, throughout the course of this year, is we'll be looking at that Horizon 2020 grant funding, which I've received in, in previous companies, Scandinavian being one, um, uh, to assist in non-dilutionary capital raising. European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, is um, uh, Kazakhstan is their biggest investment partner, about 600 million last year, including into mines. So, in terms of security, in terms of financing, we're very, very, very happy being in Kazakhstan. Um, we've been concentrating in three mineral-rich districts. Uh, we've got um, a VMS province uh, over in the east region, and we've got a gold license in the Chuli Orogenic Gold Belt, two licenses, and we have two licenses in uh, East Kostanai, which is um, uh, where our, our rare earth deposit is. So let's dive in. The purpose of this slide is to show the, the logistics of what we think is an incredibly exciting area. So the Rudnay Altai VMS belt is over 800 kilometres long, goes through Russia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia and China, and has been producing for hundreds of years from mines that have all been found at outcrop. So it's a very well studied belt, over a thousand million tonnes and incredible grades. I mean, um, Adam Yesky, Otyshky, Nikolovsky are three in, in very close proximity, three of, of, of many, many mines in the region. And the average value per tonne of those, I haven't done it more recently, but a few months ago was around six, seven hundred dollars per tonne in the ground. So if you can think if your open pit mining costs are about a dollar, dollar fifty a tonne, if your underground mining costs are about 30, 40 if you're conservative a tonne, you can see there's quite a bit of fat with those sorts of grades if you can, um, if you can pull something like that off. We've spent years collecting data on these licenses. We've spent the last eight months processing and digitising that data, and the last month now that the soil has melted, georeferencing and confirming that data. And what we have started off as a mineral resource estimate um, and is now become an exploration target because we don't have access to the core, um, but we have an asset that is uh, over 20 million tonnes of contained... Uh, sorry, 20 million tonnes at one and a half, roughly, to 2% to copper, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Logistically wonderful. Kaz Minerals is a partner. They have a processing plant 52 kilometres by road to the north, and uh, that plant has spare capacity, around 600,000 tonnes today. Uh, Kaz Inc, which is Glencore, 70% Glencore, and 30% our joint venture partner in some of our licences, Talkan Samrup, which is the sovereign wealth fund of Kazakhstan, own 30%. They have a processing plant 110 kilometres away with excess capacity. To the south, 70 kilometres, Uskomenogorsk International Airport and the Rida Smelter has excess capacity. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is that we have a project in an area with all of the infrastructure already in place and with a very, very low economic threshold for development. So despite the fact that we think we have a very good and significant size mine, um, you don't need it. You, know, you can potentially get into production with a fairly small scale development if required. So looking at that asset in a little bit more detail, um, it's no ordinary exploration target. It's an exploration target that's been from more than 42,000 
metres of drilling in the past. 97 drill holes, 62 of them make up the actual ore bodies themselves. It's an exploration target that's been developed using cutoff grades. It's not a global resource. We've been fairly conservative on this front. 0.38% grades for the open pit, and that's using, again, fairly standard and conservative um, economics, 45 degree pit walls, all the royalties, all of the regular mining costs and processing costs as you can expect from that have, have um, derived that open pit. And the underground, slightly less in terms of economics have gone into that, but we've used 0.8% copper equivalent. We also think it could be higher. So the assay results from the drilling did not include gold or silver, but there's gold or silver, there's gold or silver in the region. So uh, the sample that was taken from uh, an adit in the underground ore body had a representative sample as it was described, 0.3 grams gold and 14.2 grams silver. And so if that is representative of the whole ore body, which of course we'll be assaying for when we start drilling in the next few months, um, it does start to increase the, the potential grades up to about 2.2 um, plus percent copper equivalent. So we're very, very excited to start working there. Um, and it's a very, very well connected area. A little bit of a zoom out on the region. So the assets in the east region, we've got 803 square kilometres and it's a lot of targeting. We did a, a Heliborn EM survey over the majority of that area last year. We have, there were hundreds of anomalies that were analysed. Um, we had five uh, priority one targets, four that are drill ready. So what that means is they um, were sufficiently constrained enough for the expert geophysicists. We use MITRE Geophysics out of Australia and Kate Hine has a number of discoveries to her name. Um, uh, sufficiently constrained enough to model and make those conductors drill ready. So we have four of those that we uh, intend on targeting this year. Uh, I also like the look of our, a priority two target in this region, uh, not just because of the name, B52, um, but also because it's hosting Devonian rocks, it has rheolite mapped its surface, which is a common footwall um, indicator for these style VMS deposits, Kyoko style VMS deposits, and it has a string of IP anomalies leading up to it from our, um, our target as well. So what we feel we have is over 20 million tonnes of, of copper at 1.5 to 2% um, and a hell of a lot of exploration upside. And these conductors aren't particularly deep. There's a very good reason why they haven't been found in the past, because they don't have a surface footprint, um, particularly A9, uh, the, the two A's to the north, which are in a little bit of a marsh area. Um, but it won't uh, take very much to test these. It's something that this presentation doesn't focus on as the exploration target for the rest of the belt. So the only thing we're doing when we talk to the stock market about these assets is we're talking about completely verified data. So we weren't really bringing up Vakuba until we digitised all the data and we were very confident that this was a realistic target that we wanted to get on with. But we have you know, half a dozen at least other targets um, throughout the course of the licence, some that are sitting next to old mine shafts, six old mine shafts running at 3 to 8% copper and a string of IP anomalies just to the north in, in, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the depression. Um, that's one. There's another one that's called Rulika, uh, which again has is, is been described as an uneconomic ore body in the past. Why wasn't this mined? Well, because it was only 1.5 to 2% copper. And you're in a region where Pokrovskoy was running at 25% copper to 30% copper. So there's a very good reason why this wasn't mined in the past, because it was slightly less interesting. But I think we can all agree that 1.5 to 2% copper is pretty appealing um, in today's world. And again, we do think that'll increase, and we think that the opportunity here is also to find um, the feeder zones for these. So as an example here, we have three EM anomalies which weren't sufficiently constrained enough to model and make immediate drill-ready targets. But right along this ridge line, just as you come into the Vancouver deposit, we have three undrilled EM anomalies. So we'll hopefully formulate um, uh, or turn, convert those into drill-ready targets this year as well. So the plan here, um, in the next couple of months we'll start drilling and we had four drilling companies on site last week and um, we'll be doing geological traverse, topographical survey and then we'll be drilling this and converting this to Jort compliant this year. Uh, hopefully with a view to um, moving straight into a scoping study. There we go. Um, just to show you what could be. So uh, diluted our company at the current share price. Um, we think there's a seven to eight times uplift uh, based on a peer comparison basis. I want to reiterate once again the low economic threshold to development. Two hungry mills, 
So if you're looking at this thinking, well, you know, you've got quite a small market capitalization. What if you need to spend 50 to 80 million dollars um, to get this into production? Well, firstly, I'd say I think the EBRD would be quite happy to write that check. But secondly, I would say that um, uh, that that's not necessarily the case. We believe that we have optionality to put this into production quickly, um, if that's what we are required to do. Quickly and for low capex, if that's what we're required to do. So quite a low value on one asset that we have uh, in 800 square kilometres uh, of part of three sets of assets that we have in the portfolio. Rare earths is a, is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, for, for, for better or worse. If you're at government level, it's a buzzword because you think you don't have enough of it. Um, if you're an investor sitting in this room, it might be a buzzword because you haven't performed so well recently with some of your rare earth investments. Um, this has been a... Um, uh, a virtually free option for us to farm into. No cash outflow other than the work we're doing on the licence. Um, it's a, literally an earn-in and only once we hit a certain threshold of investment, which is $500,000, then we'll issue $250,000 worth of shares for 51%. And the same again, $500,000 in the ground and another $250,000 for us to move to 75%. And then a carry through to, um, to BFS for us to get to 90%. Uh, our partners are out, absolutely outstanding. Um, you know, a senior partner of, of um, the most prominent law firm in Kazakhstan, or in, in the CIS, I should say. Um, and the other chap is uh, ex Merrill Lynch, ex uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And his father, Bulat Murganov, uh, actually discovered Kamarovska and, um, uh, and Regoradok, which is now a six million ounce gold project, which they sold at the time for $200 million to Kazink. So, incredibly rich history of, of success in Kazakhstan. Um, and our results to date have been absolutely outstanding. So we redrilled a historical deposit, which was uh, just under 20,000 tonnes of contained rare earth, total rare earth oxides, which includes yttrium. And uh, I should point out our leapfrog modelling of that historical data actually had a 40% higher resource than that. And, so, and, and further to that, our drilling has gone deeper and shown wider intersections of kaolinite and um, rare earth oxide bearing materials. The key here with all rare earths is what are the liberation qualities? And the answer is, I'll tell you in about a month. So Tuesday we went down to the University of Brighton, we dropped off our samples and uh, we are going to be working with them. They have um, a lot of experience in, in uh, what's called ionic absorption clays, which is what we believe this to be. And uh, this test work will demonstrate whether or not that's possible. Why is that important? It's important because your leaching agent um, that you want to use for these materials is uh, hopefully relatively benign. So what you're hoping for is that basically you can use salt water to get a significant portion of these, um, of these uh, minerals uh, released from their, from their bound state. Um, so the leach test work will, will demonstrate that. And if it does demonstrate what we believe it, it should do, and again, we've done a lot of comparisons with a lot of global peers, um, well then, I believe we've got a project of, uh, of what we're calling consequential size and grade. Um, and I should say strategic importance. It's also big. So if you want to compare it to other people, we need to obviously do the drilling to explore. But if we do have 20,000 tonnes or 40 or 50,000 tonnes within the Talaric licence, well, you can see we also have an additional 12 kilometres by strike length, four or five kilometres at its widest point um, on, on just this particular region alone. So yes, it very much has the potential to host, you know, 100, 200,000 tonnes of contained um, uh, total rare earth oxides, which again, if you look to our peers, you'd be looking at market capitalisations in the hundreds of millions for this asset alone. Lastly, we have two orogenic gold licences. We're focusing on one for the moment. Um, more than 10 kilometres of strike along a very high grade prolific orogenic gold belt. Orogenic gold is fun to explore for, um, and, uh, and we've had some really good success here. It's been at the front of the portfolio because it was drill ready while we digitised the rest of the, um, uh, the data and while we farmed into our rare earths uh, project. And at the moment it's the, the third slide as you can see because it's going to take a little bit more work to take it through to Jork compliant. Um, so I'm arguing with my geologists at the moment who are desperate to go and drill this because they are telling me that we have a gold deposit. Um, uh, and for me it's all about capital allocation. 
And so we'll continue to work on this this year. Um, we believe that there is uh, a gold deposit here and we believe it has potential for something of significance along strike because of the repeated gold mineralisations, because of the strong structures. Um, we've done uh, drone mag over this whole region. We've done 25 metre space ground mag um, just at the Eshkiel Tau 2 area alone. We have artisanal operators coming onto site frequently and so there is gold there. It is potentially economic and we'll just need to continue doing some work to, uh, to, to demonstrate that. So there we are. We've had a very busy 12 months. We started in Kazakhstan in listing in, in January 2010. And I can't reiterate enough uh, what a good place it is to operate from the perspective. And, 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 and we just, to, to demonstrate that is what have we done in the last 12 months? Well, we started off with four licenses in joint venture. We've had them transferred to our joint venture company. We've pegged four additional licenses, 100% our own. Um, a number of those are within a kilometre of vi a village, which in Kazakhstan you need a social obligations agreement um, to, to peg those areas. We applied for that, we met with the district of Shemenaika and applied for that and got it three weeks later. So for those of you who have invested in any jurisdiction recently, um, you know, particularly uh, certain jurisdictions in Europe, which I've operated in the past, you'll know what a, what a fantastic outcome that is. We flew uh, nearly 3,500 line kilometres of Heliborn EM survey. We did nearly 5,000 metres of diamond drilling on two different projects in two different regions. We did 1,000 metres of RC drilling on a third project in a third region. And uh, we have obviously assayed all of those and done multiple field programs. So that is for a company with a market cap of about five and a half million pounds today. Uh, I think that's a pretty exceptional um, uh, proof that, that Kazakhstan is a wonderful place to, to do business and to operate. So you can be assured that the money that you invest in the company goes into the ground for, for its best and, and maximum effect. And I should say, so to that end, what are we doing going forwards? <laughs> well, we've got two projects we believe we'll be putting a jort resource on this year, copper and rare earths. And uh, on the basis of that, we believe we'll be taking both through to scoping study very quickly. There has been historical work um, on, on leaching for the copper, by the way, which was more than 90% recovery on the copper. So again, we feel that that's going to be, going to be quite, a, uh, quite a simple process. Uh, you know, the, a few mugs on the board. I had some photos yesterday, so unfortunately I'll have to update my photo from about 10, 15 years ago at some stage soon. There's our capital structure. Um, so we started this company as a, as a private company. We were backed by the Flannery family, which is a, a billion dollar family office out of Australia, very, very supportive. Um, so they're the largest shareholder at about 17%. I'm the second largest shareholder at about 11%. And I cannot um, say how incentivised we are to see this being a success. Um, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a significant portion of, 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 um, of, of how we plan on moving forward. We've also just recently uh, um, given our staff in Kazakhstan um, long-term incentive plans and, and the intention for me is to, to have a greater ownership in country. Um, as it stands today, I'm the only expat there. We have about eight staff and about four full-time contractors, um, all, all Kazakh. And actually, um, about 70% female. So we're up for a big year. We're up for a big year. We think we're going to, uh, as I say, convert two projects to Jork Resource, convert two projects to go into scoping study, um, both of which are critical minerals and strategic minerals. And uh, you, everyone here, I'm sure, has their own view on, on, on the forecast there. Reiterating once again, Kazakhstan has the political will to develop these projects. And that cannot be stressed highly enough. When you are looking for approvals to develop, when you're looking for approvals to explore, when you're looking for speed of execution to lower your costs, that political will is absolutely critical. And Kazakhstan is demonstrating that time and time again since they changed their mineral law in 2018 um, and their government shortly after. And I think that um, uh, it's going to be a very Central Asian focused uh, world for exploration in the not too distant future. And that's me saying it in much more uh, eloquently um, on, on a slide and staring off into the distance to, to what will be in the not too distant future. Succinct, hopefully I got across the point. Thank you very much. I will be happy to take questions.